Yes, we're open. Living Faith with Needham UCC, a sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Easter Sunday, April 4th, 2021, is entitled Death and Hope. It continues in our Grounded Worship series, examining core ideas that shape what and how we believe. It's a reflection on a reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministries at the Congregational Church of Needham, or would like to join us for worship some Sunday live via Zoom, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. We continue reading today in the Gospels, in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Let's listen together for a living word from God for us in these words from Luke. Now on that same day, that first Easter day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. And moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said, that he was alive. Some of the men who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon Peter. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Friends, God is still speaking to the world and to us. May our hearts be open to listen and to respond. Amen. 
I'm so grateful to Reverend Maddie for sharing that version of the Easter story that she did with us this morning. It wasn't until this week that I realized that I had scheduled the whole service without actually reading that story, which is, after all, the whole point of Easter morning worship, right? The story that we all know about those women disciples, Mary and Mary and Mary, Joanna and Salome going to the tomb early on the first day of the week to give the body of Jesus the traditional anointing denied him at his death on Good Friday. But when they arrive, they find the stone already rolled away and are greeted by angelic messengers with the good news that he is not there. He is not dead. He is risen. And even as they are turning away, they come face to face with the resurrected Jesus himself, still so awash in morning glory that they barely recognize him. But there's no denying, there he is, big as life, Jesus in the resurrected flesh. That's what we usually hear, some version of that, if we make it to church on Easter morning. But truth be told, I have always preferred this reading from later in the story, from Luke's story of the road to Emmaus, that the Revised Common Lectionary that guides our scripture reflection Sunday by Sunday sets not for Easter morning, but for Easter evening. But that's not just because I'm not much of a morning person. There's something about this story that feels more familiar to me. This feels like my own experience of the good news of Easter. And not just because because I'm a pastor and I'm awfully busy on Easter morning and it's only by the time things cool off and slow down by Easter afternoon that I have an opportunity to sit and reflect No, this feels more familiar from our situation here generally, late in time, theologically speaking. I wasn't there when the first Easter morning was breaking, when the first dewfall was still on the first grass. I wasn't the first at the tomb, or the third, or the 3,333rd. But Easter afternoon, Easter evening, somehow that feels right for me. As someone who, like the disciples in our story today, Cleopas and the unnamed disciple, whom biblical scholars are more and more convinced was likely a woman, unnamed, of course, more like those disciples and how they encountered the good news how they heard that Jesus had been raised, but they've not experienced it themselves. It is still a third-person story, something that happened to someone else and has to be related to them. They're not really sure what to believe. What they know for sure is that things have not turned out the way they'd hoped. For sure, Jesus has died, and not of natural causes but of all too human causes. The religious and governmental authorities have colluded to kill him in order to shut him up permanently and his talk of revolutionary love that would literally turn the world upside down, that is right side up, God's side, justice and peace and compassion side up at last. That's what they'd hoped for. What Jesus had promised and preached and practiced, that's why they left their lives, gave up everything to follow him in the first place. And that vision is what kept them following him uphill and down. That sense of belonging, of being known, of being valued, of a life rich with meaning. They had cheered with the crowds lining the road just a short week ago as he had ridden into Jerusalem, into the very heart of the nation. But then that last hill and that last down, down, down. 
that had been too much. Their dreams were shattered, scattered, and they along with them, the circle broken and broken hearted. What was it all for in the end? What did it all mean if it meant anything at all for them personally, much less for the wider world? What was the point of all of this fuss if it wasn't going to change anything? That's what they were talking about on the road. The Greek is even more emphatic. They weren't just chatting. They were arguing. They were deep in it, trying to convince themselves as much as each other that it hadn't all been a waste of time, that it wasn't just a fairy story that flew in the face of the way the world really operates, that it hadn't been a whole year of their lives wasted. Regardless, they agreed it was better to go back to before, back to the way things had been, you know, not so bad, but not so good, but at least predictable, familiar, Sad, but simpler. Better the devil you know, they say. Better to go back home to Emmaus and try to pick up the pieces and just try to get back to normal. They were so wrapped up in this inner conversation that they barely noticed the stranger sidling up alongside them on the road as they walked and talked. At first, he barely seemed real. The pain and grief and despair they carried with them was so much more real to them. Even as he asked and they answered, even as the whole story came spilling out again, as it does in times of grief, one whole thread pouring forth What things? The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and about how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped. We had hoped for so much more. We had hoped for something different. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. And now it is the third day since these things took place and the deed is done. But some others of our group have astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of of angels even who said that he is alive. But we do not know what to believe or even how to believe. So we are here on this road, putting all this behind us and just going home. But this time when the stranger spoke, they noticed. And as he spoke and they walked along together, he became less hazy and more present to them. As he pulled them out of themselves and walked with them through the events they recounted and the stories of Scripture the very same stories Jesus had shared with them. The word of the Lord in the words of the prophets of Israel who proclaimed that a change was going to come, but only at a cost. That in order for a new world to be born, the entire world would have to go through the birth pangs and the old world would have to die. That in fact, death is not the problem. Suffering is not the problem. Death and suffering are part of life, but meaningless suffering that benefits all too few and beats down all too many. Meaningless death extracted to grease the wheels of empire to keep the trains running on time and the orders from Amazon pouring in. That's the problem. Jesus didn't die for our sins, 
as a willing offering on the altar of old time religion, but rather Jesus died for our sins because of our sins, because our sins demanded he bow to the old gods of normal and familiar, and that's the way we've always done it, and too big to fail, and too complex to change or do anything about it, and Jesus would not accept that. He would not bow. Jesus believed in a larger life, too much to bow to a meaningless death of the body and the spirit. He died to throw himself a wrench into a soul-crushing machine and bring it to a halt. The disciples on the road hung on this stranger's every word. As the day and their journey drew to a close, they couldn't stand to let him go. So they asked him to stay for dinner. But still, they didn't recognize him. I think that's another part of the story that feels so real to me. They felt the presence of something, of something deep and holy with them, reframing their questions, shifting their thinking, drawing them out of their old lives and opening the door to another better way and inviting them in, but they didn't have a name for it. It wasn't until they sat at table with him and he took the bread and broke it and took the cup and shared it It wasn't until he had gone, in fact, that they knew what had happened, that they could name the change bubbling up inside them. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening this way for us? This is the spirit of Jesus at work. Truly, he is not dead. He is alive. Truly, we are not dead, and we are alive with him. And they turned. They turned from the road before him. They turned back and found that was the real way forward. Not a way or around, but through all of that grief, all of that loss, all of that death, the way to a life that really is life, a life worth living, worth losing even. They abandoned their hope of returning to normal, even some sort of new normal that really was the painful past just repackaged for a larger living hope of moving into a new and extraordinary way of life. They could not, they they would not return to a simpler time. For with the eyes of their heart now open wide, they understood that what had seemed like simplicity in the moment had only been yet another man-made myth made by a few for the benefit of even fewer. How could they ever have believed that normal was good? The resurrection? That has the ring of truth about it, a truth worth believing. Friends, no matter where you find yourself on the road of your life in this moment, I want to invite you to trust that resurrection is a truth worth believing, that the way shown to us by Christ is a way worth walking, that this is a life worth living, even losing, for the sake of the whole wide world and the gospel good news that is abundant life for all whom God has made, all whom God loves, not just for us and for our family and friends and neighbors, but even for strangers, even those who we consider and who consider us their enemies. This is a good news with power in it 
to change the world, to move from a normal to an extraordinary existence, an Easter existence. Thanks be to God that whether we heard it first in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening or in the depths of night, this good news is ours to share here today. Thanks be to God.